First of all, I want to welcome everyone to the third session today in our HANA Resource Group Zoom series, um, Job Hunting in a Pandemic, a Survival Guide to Rejoining the Workforce. My name is Casey Williams, and I will be introducing everyone today. Um, for those of you that are new to our sessions, this is the third of five sessions where we will dive into the most critical aspect of the job search and give you tools that you also will need to focus on to set yourself up for success. We see this journey broken down into logical areas that will help you stay the course as you move from an applicant to a candidate and then hopefully to that ideal state as a candidate where you will potentially be receiving a job offer. If you missed any previous um, recorded sessions, do not stress. We have these sessions recorded on our website at hannahresource.com along with the previous slide deck for you to review as well. Because this is a free series, we do encourage you to continue to share with your network and invite those that you feel might really benefit from our session. Um, the session for today, once it's completed, um, we should have that information uploaded on the website within 24 hours for you to review. A couple reminders about today's session. Um, we will have everyone muted during the session just so that we can make sure we stay on pace and that you're able to hear all of the speakers that will be presenting today. Um, there's a lot of content to cover, so we feel that that's the best way to make sure we can keep the program moving in the right direction. With that said, we encourage you to participate throughout um, by directing your questions to the chat box that's located at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will be monitoring that chat feature and we do assure you that we will address as many of the questions as we can um, throughout the session and at our question and answer at the end of the presentation. Now we can go ahead and get started and go over some of the things that we will be discussing on today's session. Um, today's session, we will talk about cracking the code on the digital applications and the application tracking system, ways to evaluate your digital presence and social media tips that you can use, maximizing LinkedIn, demystifying online assessment, the power of virtual networking, digital communication, and follow-up, and we'll get some insight from Workforce Center resources and the Kentucky Career Center Job Seeker Services. In our session next week, um, which will be our fourth session, we will go over interviewing in the new normal with guest speaker Perry Scholes um, from Progressive HR Strategy. And then in our final session um, for week five, we will offer, we will cover offer consideration and negotiations. And the guest speaker for that session will be David Baumgartner from Executive Coach My Policies. Um, now we'll go ahead and introduce the HANA Resource Group team members who have been working tirelessly to put together these amazing sessions for you today. Ray Davis is our career transition coach. He has over 30 years of career and job coaching experience. 19 years in marketing and sales, and he has provided acquisition program support for Wright Management Company. He has a bachelor's from UK in business and also his MBA from Ohio State. John Coffey is our director of talent acquisition. He has 15 years in talent acquisition with 11 years in leadership. He has eight plus years in national and global talent selection. He obtained his MBA from Ohio University and has supported hundreds of Fortune 500 to 50 to 500 U.S. companies. He serviced in many different industries from banking, auto, telecom, information technology, engineering, medical device assembly, security clearance, supply chain, corporate staffing, recruiting technology, and change management consulting. Andrea Tyra is our HR coordinator at HANA Resource Group. She is a 2019 business management graduate from EKU and is a current MBA candidate from EKU as well. We are really excited to welcome our guest speakers for today's session. We have Amy Glasscock and Beth Davison. 
Amy Glasscock is the Director of Workforce Services for the Bluegrass Workforce Development Area. She began her career with Workforce 15 years ago at the Kentucky Career Center in Lexington. Amy has a vast amount of workforce experience working in all aspects of service delivery from individual case managers for both youth and adults, program development for adult services, overseeing the establishment and operation of multiple career centers across the region to perform business service functions, including rapid response events and employer engagement. Beth Davison is the founding executive director of the Kentucky Chamber Workforce Center. The Workforce Center is a part of the Philharmonic arm of the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce, the state's largest association of advocating on behalf of business. Beth joined the chamber in 2017 to begin building the Workforce Center and its only fully dedicated employee. Since then, the center has grown to a team of nine and continues to expand their support to employers and efforts in building stronger workforce. Beth is a lifelong resident of Kentucky, earning her undergraduate degree from the University of Kentucky and MBA from Sullivan University. She has spent the last 10 plus years advocating for workforce in Kentucky and the nation's capital and aligning talent to the strategic plans of business. Beth was honored as a top 40 under 40 and named a top 20 people to know in human resources by Business First Louisville. Previous employers include Greater Louisville Incorporated, the Oliver Group, and Sullivan University. Beth also serves as a Workforce Readiness Chair for the Kentucky Society for Human Resource Management. You see um, the information for our next two sessions and the presenters are located here as well with Terry Scholl, the president of Progressive HR Strategies for next week's session, as well as David Baumgartner for our final session in week five. Today's topic that we will be covering is overcoming digital disappointment, enhancing your digital footprint, creating a digital handshake, and conquering the challenges of digital job hunting. Today, we will cover digital job hunting and understanding applicant tracking systems, refining your digital presence and social media footprint, digital next, virtual net, networking, the art of the follow-up, insights from the Kentucky Workforce Center, as well as job seeker and business services. So now, without further ado, I will go ahead and pass the torch on over to John Coffey to get us started with today's presentation. Wow, what a great introduction. Thanks so much, Casey, and welcome everybody back to our third session. All right, so we got a lot going on today. Um, we're going to go ahead and dive right in. So um, the first part of our uh, session today we're going to talk about is digital job hunting and just really understanding a little bit more about applicant tracking systems. So Digital job hunting, uh, we, know, we all know there's a little bit of mystery around how the applications get processed when you apply, uh, but the more you know about how things work, I think the better that you can learn how to use it to your advantage. Coming from someone um, that has been in the industry a long time, I'm really here to help you understand just a bit more about what goes on beyond, behind the curtain. So. The reality of digital job applications, first off, um, I, you know, there's no beating around the bush. They're impersonal. Um, the way old applications used to work where you could walk up and look someone in the eye and hand them a piece of paper, well, that's pretty much gone today. Um, only in isolated circumstances does that work. So the way systems are set up, they take all the bias out from the start, and generally they're going to comb for specific keywords that track back to the ideal state of a job description. Very hard to show your personality to a bunch of zeros and ones, right? So that makes it a little tough. Um, they're also, uh, in digital job applications, the way that they are scanning your information, it's going to be highly objectified. Um, systems are generally looking for one plus one uh, equaling two, and not so much one plus one maybe could equal two, right? So given the AI um, or artificial intelligence and ranking factors that are now baked into systems, uh, the one thing I just really want to share is that if you aren't meeting requirements to a high degree and you're not aligning out of the gate, that can push you down the list pretty quickly. 
Um, also, um, you know, uh, digital applications will give you very little insight to how long a position has actually been open. Uh, the little trick to the trade that a lot of you may not know is that uh, some companies will just post jobs for what they call a formality. So if they have an in internal position that they're looking to fill, uh, they may have a requirement where they've got to put it out on the internet for five days, but they already they may already have an internal candidate identified. Also, the other nebulous thing is, uh, you know, you could see a posting and it could say, hey, that, that uh, you know, it kicked up and you saw it on Indeed five days ago. Well, that doesn't mean it was the first time they posted that job. And the reality is they may have other candidates already interviewing and in the process. So it gives you no idea of time frame. Um, also, it makes it, it makes it a little difficult to stand out in the crowd, right? You can't really show your personality or flair uh, when they're just kind of scanning a bunch of words. And, uh, and also, the reality is sometimes it just doesn't always make it to a human. Uh, depending on how attractive the job is, you could get hundreds of applicants to a job within just a couple of days. And it makes it very hard for recruiters to really see your information depending on where you fall in that stack. So what do we need to do here? Uh, well, first off, I think it starts by really looking at applicant tracking systems and how they are used. So we call that in the industry an ATS. We just shorten it down. Um, so each system really has a unique process to them, but there's some similarities for that. Um, you know, what they're trying to do primarily is help companies funnel, collect, organize, and filter applicants in a way that it makes sense uh, for what they're looking for. Uh, they call that internally kind of a workflow. Uh, and so uh, when your application pings in and hits the system, uh, generally it's going to, again, filter one way or another. And, uh, and then from there, that's when somebody could potentially review it. They're going to really start by pulling your specific keywords um, that are going to help them rate your application to the job. But an ATS doesn't uh, have the capability to really interpret language uh, like humans can. So there's some. So if you have a grammatical error, if there's some meanings or paraphrasing that's specific to a company that may not, uh, you know, align generally in the industry, uh, you might miss the boat there. So what things should should you do um, when applying for an ATS? When applying to an ATS in a digital job application process? Well. I think it starts with kind of understanding how pre-screening questions work. First off, that's the first thing you're going to see um, outside of uploading your resume is you're going to get hit with a couple of pre-screening questions. Now, they could be easy. It could say, are you at least 18 years of age? Or are you legally authorized to work in the United States? Or it could be something as more intense, like do you have at least five years of experience in X industry? Uh, but just know those questions can knock you out and uh, also there's a point of truth and honesty that you've got to have with yourself. If you if you don't have the experience and they're really making that a pre screen qualification, it could be a pretty good indicator that, you know, that company is, you know, maybe not open to others. Now, there's some ways around that. We'll talk about that, but um, that's something certainly to keep in mind. Also, there's some employers tell, tell to look out for. Um, now, if you see a job posting and it's got requirements listed under that posting, in the summary, in the requirements, if you've seen several times that they're looking for somebody that has certain industry experience, maybe they list the number of years or they're repetitively saying the same thing, well, guess what? That's what's most important to them. So there's two things to think about there. One is that you, uh, first off, need to really make sure that if you're going to apply to that job that you align to what they're asking for. Um, and secondly, you got to make sure that you've got those skills that they're looking for. If that's very important to them and you see it not only in the job description in several places, but also when you get into apply and it's a pre-screening question, then you know that's going to be probably one of the top things that they're looking for. So keep that in mind. Um, also, portability. Um, resumes can be in all shapes and formats. We talked a lot about a resume workshop uh, last week, and Ray gave us a lot of good insights there. But at the end of the day, um, your resume needs to be able to transition into the system fairly easily. Now, when you port a resume in, if it's in a wonky format, unfortunately, your your data could get garbled. It could it could uh, potentially um, be a detriment for you if it's not uh, easily uploaded into the system. So, uh, so you'll see oftentimes when you parse a resume in yourself, you may have uh, everything just out of order. 
um, and you got to take the time to go in and clear that up because, uh, you know, depending on how the recruiter scans uh, the information, um, you know, it could put you at a disadvantage. You really have to keep that in mind. Also, finally, I think, um, you know, you got to look at how you customize your information for the job as well. Uh, again, I can't stress enough if, if you're seeing certain things that are calling out to you in the job description and the application part, um, that might mean you need to touch up your resume or cover letter a little bit to reinforce what you have going on there. Uh, Andrea, Casey, or anyone on the call, do you have any uh, thoughts or other insights around that? Around no, I have a question. At all? Sure. Yep. Um, does the, the PDF format get garbled as well? Well, normally they're not going to pull data off a of PDF format unless they have something that can scan it or parse it in that way. So generally, um, a word's going to be easier because of how the data comes off it. But think of a PDF sometimes as a picture. And unless they have some kind of an Adobe product that can scan those words, uh, then, you know, then you may actually be typing in your work history oftentimes. Good. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, um, so the next thing that we really need to think about is um, refining the uh, digital presence and social media. So social, social media is another piece to the, to the digital equation. It's not something we can ever get around, um, especially now. So um, what is my digital presence and why is it important? Those are things that you gotta think about as a candidate. Uh, so your digital presence really is gonna allow employers to get you know you beyond, you know, beyond the words on a page, right? That's going to include what you stand for, and it's going to show further alignment to the company. Um, it's often the first thing that recruiters and hiring managers will look, look at if they decide that they're interested in your credentials. Andrea, we, we've got a little poll for you guys. I'm just curious, uh, as far as social media, how often, uh, or excuse me, um, I'm actually curious, how often do you think folks actually review social media? Uh, so, Andrew, you want to put that poll out there? And we'll just give a quick minute here, but uh, what percentage of candidates think about their social media presence? We'd love you guys to, to give a guess at that. All right. Well, Andrea, whenever you get a chance, we'll share those answers. Okay. There you go. Okay. Pretty split out across the board. So, 98% um, for. Great. So, uh, actually, here's the real stat. So, only 36% of candidates really think that social media is something that's reviewed. Um, I've, got an, I've got another poll for you, um, and it's more about how recruiters actually, how often they actually review social media. So you want to put that one out there, Andrea? Yes. And this will just give a little bit of clarity into how impactful this is. So thank you for the participation, guys. I think this is a good insight. All right. Well, looks like we got mostly the right answer there. Um, so, yeah, 74% of recruiters or uh, decision makers at the employer are checking your social media. So very, very important uh, to consider that as you go. So um, if social media is so important, what are some things that we need to be thinking about? Well, first off, um, if, if you didn't know this before, do not assume anything is ever private on social media. Um, you know, when you put something out on the internet, uh, the, the, the reality is it's out there for the world to see. And so if you're using social media often, you need to understand who your audience is. Uh, they're always watching, and sometimes they're always judging a little bit and reporting back. It could be a coworker. It could be somebody that you know that you, that you weren't aware of that works at that company that you want to work at. So it's just something to keep in mind, especially during the job search, what you're putting out there. 
and how it's being reviewed. Also, um, keeping the social media posts clean. I'm, I'm sure that's uh, pretty obvious, but you never know who's reading. And uh, too often do we see stories uh, in my industry about candidates telling their social media that maybe they're getting a new job and, uh, and, and they haven't left their old job yet. Whoops, right? And uh, so their employer finds out before they even give notice that that person is leaving. Also, speaking ill of a company, um, you know, regardless of the situation, if it's a toxic scenario, um, it could get in front of an audience that you don't want to, especially when you're out there uh, looking for a job. So be careful about that. Uh, just what you're sharing and how you share it, uh, because uh, that can certainly create a create a hard conversation when you get into an interview. Also. Uh, Pictures, um, it, it, it leads to be said, but pictures that could show questionable behavior um, oftentimes could weigh the decision between you and another candidate. So certainly just be careful about that as well. Um, the other kind of things that, um, you know, uh, it's just like at the dinner table, sometimes it's best to leave, uh, you know, politics out of the equation. Well, um, you know, that, that seems to be true in the industry as well for employers and their review. Um, you know, often if they see a heavy political stance presented one way or the other, um, and it could lead to maybe vulgar comments about sides or candidates even, um, that could be flagged as a detractor and you don't want that kind of attention. So um, certainly keep that in mind as well. So I, I think the kind of the basics is don't say anything on social media. You wouldn't say to someone else in person or you wouldn't say to your employer. Um, also, you know, be consistent across your profiles. You may have the various social media profiles uh, but the one thing I think that, that employers and recruiters are trying to get a sense of is who you are. So who you are should really resonate across any of your profiles. You're kind of, again, going back to our first session, building a personal brand means you're, you're really representing who you are across all of these platforms. Um, and make sure also with uh, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, those are kind of the big three. Um, you know, some of those you can set as private, and that's okay if you decide to do that. You know, I, I know a lot of people that are uh, maybe employed or, and, you know, they just use their, their Facebook, for example, as their private, so they, they set everything private, and that's fine. Um, so I just kind of bear in mind those are kind of the top three, um, if you didn't already think about that. Um, also, Instagram, I think, is a good one, again, for pictures. So, again, just be careful there. Um, but uh, I think the final piece is if you aren't using the social media, then maybe you want to lose it. So uh, one example I can share is uh, I had a candidate that, you know, had a Twitter from six years ago, and it showed that, um, you know, <laughs> they, they hadn't used it since, and, and their last post was something about graduating from uh, high school. And so from that point of view, they were already in, they'd already graduated college and in their career for a couple of years. So it was a little bit of a disconnect between the two. So I would say if you need to cut the cord on some of those that maybe you stopped using, a uh, good time to do it. Because when, when an employer or somebody's out there combing your social media, they don't know. They don't know what you're using and what you're not using. They're just going to see what pops up first. So bear that in mind for sure. Um, any other insights from the team here on social media that I haven't covered? Okay, great. Now, um, the big one, LinkedIn, king of social media, right? Especially when we're talking about professional networking. Uh, so specifically the king of professional networking, uh, I, I think a lot of us wouldn't argue that. I've got a poll here. Um, Andrea, you wanna go ahead and pull that up? That I'm gonna have you kind of think about. And while we're doing that, um, apologize, apologies. Uh, so while we're doing that, 77% 70 of recruiters are actually on LinkedIn. Uh, if we look through the math and the stats here, LinkedIn currently has over 610 million users, uh, and the network has 303 million active monthly users, 40% of which visit the site daily, and 90 million are senior level influencers, and 63 million are decision makers. 92% um, of Fortune 500 companies, 57% of companies have a LinkedIn company page. Uh, LinkedIn is responsible for 80% of business-to-business -business leads from social media, and job seekers spend up to 30 minutes a day on LinkedIn. So if those stats don't give you color, LinkedIn is really important in the job search. So um, 
Now, along those lines, uh, you know, what's important for maximizing LinkedIn is how often you are using it. So, um, we've got a lot of mixed examples here, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly, never. Now, I will say I love monthly, um, but, you know, this could be situation dependent. My advice here for how often you update your profile really is that anytime you have a major milestone in, at your workplace, you add a new skill, um, you're, you upskill, you get a certification, you complete an education program, you get a promotion. Those kind of milestone markers, uh, you know, think about your resume and your LinkedIn profile as a living, breathing representation of who you are. And so anytime those things change, that's when you should be updating. Um, too often do I see folks, you know, step away from their LinkedIn and they haven't even updated their most recent employers or, um, you know, hey, they got a promotion, but when I go to their profile, I saw their last position and then I'm scratching my head on, well, your title doesn't align, right? So certainly something to keep in mind there. So it's all about really maximizing how you're using LinkedIn. And, uh, you know, the, the first part of that is updating your, your headline, making sure that's attractive. Um, the three things that employers look for first, especially if they are not connected to you, there's only three things you can see if you're private, uh, which is the photo, the title, and the headline. Those are the most important things that you got to always think about. Um, and then also, uh, when you're on LinkedIn, you know, be engaged, uh, especially if you're a job seeker. Like what others write, share comments, share posts, share articles, um, get active, get involved. Highlight your recent experience and skill set. I'm about to show you a profile here that, that is really going to blow your mind, but it's all about what you're doing today, what you've done recently. Uh, you might have a lot of great cr credentials, but employers and, and uh, recruiters, they're working in real time. How can you make an impact to that employer right now? Um, and add any professional uh, content and video content that enhances who you are. The great thing about social media is that you have other mediums that you can tap into. You can show documents, you can show presentations, you can show videos of, of what you do. Maybe you're a carpenter and you, and you build a house and, you know, and it was a really big job and it was complex. And so have a YouTube video, link that to your LinkedIn profile, something to think about for sure. Um, also, um, don't be afraid to ask for skills, endorsements, and recommendations from your trusted colleagues. I'm curious here, we've got another poll. Um, how often do you um, actually ask for skills or endorsements or recommendations? And while we're, while we're waiting on those uh, statistics to come in, um, I will just say that uh, I think um, that's one of the biggest misses that I see. Uh, especially if you are accomplishing milestones in your uh, career. Um, so again, maybe you upskill, you add a new skill, um, you're getting validation along the way, uh, clients are commending you for your work, um, you have a colleague that just, you worked on a really large project. Okay, so you see this, 56% of you have said you've never used it. You need to start using it. That is a, is a, is a it's like a testimonial website for you. <laughs> but it's on your personal profile. So anytime you do something good, don't be afraid to ask for, hey, if you thought I did a good job, help me out. Or, you know, there's a good switch. Uh, a lot of, you know, in the recruiting industry with our colleagues, if we work uh, across projects, you know, oftentimes I'll endorse um, them for saying, wow, you know, they just killed it for project management or they did a great job recruiting. And I'll, I'll go ahead and give them an endorsement and then they'll give me one back. So. Um, again, you're just kind of enhancing who you are and showing that you're doing good work. And that's going to speak volumes to an employer before they even start talking to you. So uh, any other thoughts, team, around uh, LinkedIn uh, and maximizing before I go into the profile here to show? Uh, John, there's a question that popped up. Is the LinkedIn sure. skills validation request an automated feature or do we just personally ask our colleagues? So um, you're going to list on LinkedIn when you go on your profile what your skills are and uh, and then oftentimes they can do it one of two ways. Uh, you can list your skills and then they can go ahead and further validate that, check that box for you, or um, if you work with a colleague, a colleague may just go in and say, you know, I worked with you and these were some of the skills that I saw for you. So it can go both ways, uh, but I think uh, certainly um, worth, worth the ask if, uh, if you're in a project for sure. And then another question came in, 
asking for endorsements are like asking for recommendation letters. No one is going to give you a bad endorsement. How is this beneficial to an employer? Well, that's true. But again, if you're thinking about your recent um, experiences, you know, employers still like that validation. So if you are about, if you came off, uh, if you're unemployed and you came off a, a work scenario, um, you know, you're going to have employers that say, gosh, I would work with, you know, X person again. Uh, they did a great job in X, Y, and Z. What they're doing is endorsing your, your skills and your capability. Um, so again, recommendation letters are very important. I will tell you that references are as antiquated as that might seem, can make or break uh, an, an offer decision. So um, why not get, it, get ahead of it and get them in, in advance? It won't hurt. If anything, it won't hurt, it will help, right? All right, so great question. So let's go into a profile example that we can get behind here. Um, so Oprah Winfrey, everybody knows who Oprah is. Uh, you know, she has been around for a long time and accomplished wonderful, wonderful things. First thing I wanna point out here is Oprah has an incredible profile picture. It's light, it's bright, great smile. Uh, she also has a LinkedIn banner, if you see that behind her. Banners are really important. Um, you know, those are, those are, you know, you don't want them to detract, you want them to help. So she, she's sending a powerful message there with her banner, but uh, she also has her title. Very simple, easy to understand. These are the things that she do, does in her title, right? Um, also in her about, she's got a really good breakdown of who she is, uh, what she has done, and some of the achievements that she had. Not all of them, but just a good high level overview. Um, also, as you get in, she's got a featured section that gives a little bit of her credentials, right? Some of the things that she's done that's helped her get to where she is today. And uh, when you get into experience, the first thing listed there is what she's been up to recently. Uh, so since January 2011, she's a chairman and CEO of the own Oprah Winfrey Network. Uh, but also, she's got, if you see here, she's got a piece of media, launching own with Oprah. So again, she's tying in some other formats not just words on, on, a, on a page, right? So a little bit more dynamic there. Um, and then further, if you go down, you'll see that, uh, you know, the one thing that we all know Oprah for was that she was the host of the Oprah Winfrey show. But if we back up, um, you know, I'm gonna go to the previous slide again here real quick. A uh, little bit more of a breakdown in what she's doing recently. But if you go back here, 26 years, she was the host of the Oprah Winfrey show. Does she have 27 bullets that list that out? No, because to her, that's not, that, that was in the past, right? It's important, she's got it listed, but that's not what she's doing today. So she's focusing on the relevant and the recent. Um, also, I think it's great, she's got volunteer experience here, um, some wonderful accomplishments listed. So you guys see where I'm going with this. So at the end of the day, LinkedIn, I think is gonna be really, really helpful for you. Um, and certainly, you, I would even recommend when we talked about it in the resume workshop, be proud of it, list it on your resume even, make it easy for recruiters to find you, um, and, and that's going to really accent and go a long way. Team, before I go into assessments, any other thoughts or questions around LinkedIn? Okay, so um, demystifying online assessments. Uh, we can't talk about online applications without talking a little bit out, uh, about of ass assessments. I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but online assessments for a job can really be used one of two ways. It can either qualify you further for a role, so they have a specific purpose in mind, maybe it's a skills evaluation for that particular uh, <clears throat> job title. So for example, uh, in IT, a lot of times you'll see coding exercises uh, done just to validate that you know what you're doing for a specific, um, you know, it could be Java or SQL, et cetera. Um, and then uh, it, it could also be used in another way, personality profile. So maybe that's not, um, uh, you know, being objective. Maybe it's more finding about who you are and do you fit in the culture? You know, you hear in HR, we talk often a lot about cultural fit. Well, it's a real thing, folks, and this is where it starts. Uh, so those personality assessments are gonna go a long way. So think about that when you're taking those, take them seriously, dedicate, uh, have uninterrupted, dedicated time when you're doing these assessments and think about what they're gonna be used for. Now, if it's an objective assessment, the likelihood is that that could knock you out. If they are looking for a score or a certain type of performance, that could potentially 
uh, be a knockout. So very important that you do well on that. If it is a, a personality profile, that might not be a knockout, but what they're gonna do is evaluate you versus other candidates to see who's the closer cultural fit. So make sure you have a good understanding of what they're looking for, and I think that'll help. Uh, also, I wanted to just speak to the value of pre-assessments in the space. Um, we don't really think about this a, a, enough, I think, uh, as far as uh, from a candidate perspective, but um, you know, right now we are in a state where you may be unemployed. Um, you know, I think pre-assessments really do share a lot of um, ability to further qualify you, give a representation of you based on some of the skills that you can do. There's a couple places that I recommend um, maybe taking a look at. LinkedIn Learning is, is certainly uh, one of those. And uh, with LinkedIn Learning, um, you can get 30 days free access to it. Uh, but if you're a premium LinkedIn member, you actually get any of the LinkedIn learning assessments for free, and those will actually list on your profile, which is pretty cool. Um, also, Indeed has a lot of assessments as well. They are all free, and uh, certainly employers will look at those depending on the job. And, it, and again, it's all about what can help not hurt you. So uh, just going to give a couple of snapshots. This is what LinkedIn learning looks like. Um, did we have a question come in, Andrea? <clears throat> That was very good. I did not. Perry, Perry said, go ahead. Sorry. There weren't any questions that came in. Yeah, Perry had a good comment there. Don't try to game the assessment system. Present your true self. That's right. Um, so even when you're talking about those, um, you know, personality profile assessments, you want to make sure the culture at that employer is right for you, too. So just make sure you're representing yourself, uh, you know, truthfully. Great, great comment there. All right, so LinkedIn Learning, this is what it looks like. Um, there's a lot of cool things on there. Uh, you know, digital body language. Hey, you know, how do you, how do you think about body language when you're digital or, or interviewing, right? Uh, do I have to wear pants when I interview? Yes, absolutely. But, you know, here, here's some things uh, that you can certainly put on there. Just show, um, especially if you're unemployed, this shows employers that you're being productive right now. So not only are you looking for a job, but you're also trying to upskill or enhance your skills or find other ways to, um, you know, be productive and show that to an employer. And I think that that, that goes a long way. Also, uh, again, I mentioned Indeed assessments. This is kind of what it looks like. You can actually take these in advance. Uh, some employers will actually ask you to take these, but if you've already got them done, it's one less step you have to do. So think about your industry and where some of these might make sense. I would say, um, you know, from the point of view of uh, time associated, you know, of course, you're going to be applying the job, but if you can carve out a little bit of time here and there to think about this, I think that can certainly help. Um, team, any, any other thoughts about uh, pre-assessments before we move on to virtual networking? Um, there's one more question that came in. Do you recommend paying for the LinkedIn premium service? I think it depends on your financial situation. Um, I would say, you know, maybe use that 30-day trial make sure you can get what you want out of it i think you can get a lot of those accomplished within that time frame um if you feel it's necessary and you're on a longer stretch and you're you know in a financial place where it makes sense then maybe um i think that's going to be situational on the individual and then all right um, um, go ahead does it automatically put the linkedin learning on your profile or how does that show up it should show up uh, on there. Um, so I, I, I think once you complete it, it should show it as kind of a badge underneath, yeah. All right, so um, virtual networking. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're, we're closing down on time and Beth's getting ready to, to hop on here. So I wanna make sure we go through this. So um, first off, virtual networking is, is huge right now, especially given the climate. So in a world where it's hard to get out physically interact. Uh, virtual networking is more important than ever, but, you know, re in reality is it, it's been it was important before COVID. It's just more important even now. Um, it's the new normal for networking. We're seeing large-scale networking events actually happen online now, and, uh, and truthfully, you know, looking to connect with LinkedIn, uh, folks on LinkedIn, and, and um, you know, even when you are in a virtual networking scenario, again, very professional. A lot of people are dressing up to say hi and network uh, online in those events. So it's very interesting to see. 
Um, one of the things that you're going to really want to do first and foremost once you get into virtual networking is let people know you're available. On LinkedIn, you can change your profile to say, um, you know, hey, I'm open to opportunities, or you can do it just for recruiters if you don't want the whole world to know. Also, you see a lot in headlines that, um, you know, folks are, are, are saying, hey, I'm open and ready to get back to work. Um, and, and I'm even seeing people do in their pictures, like a little tag above them saying, hashtag ready to work. So that's pretty interesting. But again, you want to get the message out there, start doing that today. Um, and when you get on LinkedIn, if you've never had a LinkedIn profile, the first thing you're going to do is import your contacts. You're going to do that with your phone. Uh, and, and then uh, from there, it's going to hit everybody up in your phone and your network. And from there, I would start with your colleagues, your close, close friends and colleagues, and then um, that's where the fun's going to start. You're going to start to build out your network, first, second degree connections, um, and certainly keep keep that expanding while you're in your job search. Um, research also the companies that you're interested in. So, um, you know, that, that, that seems like a no-brainer, but the companies that you're interested in, there might be opportunities to follow them, start connecting with folks there. Um, especially if you have an in or, oh, I know that person. I didn't know they worked there, right? So you're, you're going to you're gonna start connecting those dots, and I think that's going to be crucial. Doing your homework uh, is going to go a long way. Um, asking for an introduction, very important. Um, if you uh, want to work for a dream company and uh, you know somebody that works there, so ask for a warm introduction. Um, I think it's a little bit harsher to do a cold outreach to a recruiter and say, hey, I'm available. I'd love to come work for you when you don't know them. So um, you know, if you have a, a medium, somebody that can vouch for you, um, they've got a personal relationship and some trust already built, and they can give you a warm introduction, it's going to go a long way. So I would, I would definitely recommend that. Um, leverage professional groups and alumni associations. Another thing on LinkedIn that gets overlooked often is um, use, utilizing those to your advantage, um, especially if you're in a specific industry. Uh, it could be IT, it could be marketing, it could be a lot of different industries. They have specific groups that you can join, and you can start networking there with like-minded professionals. Also, alumni, if you graduated from college, get involved there. You might make some connections where people are working at employers that you're interested in. Um, research the decision makers at the company, for sure. Make sure that, uh, you know, you know who those executives are. Not necessarily are you reaching out and saying, hey, give me a job, but it's more of uh, doing your homework, right? And uh, I, always, I always tell candidates when they get into an interview with an employer, look at their website, understand what they do, but also look at who's part of the interview process, where they've come from, what they've done. You might find some commonality. Hey, our kids played on the same baseball team. Oh, you volunteered for that organization? So did I. So there, there's some common ground that you can find there. And networking, I hate to say this, guys, but um, you know, if you're frustrated that people aren't accepting your invitations during the day, some people are still out there working, so don't stress. Um, Studies are showing that, you know, a very, very low percentage, I think it's around 7 or 8% of people are actually on LinkedIn during the day unless they're doing it like I am uh, for a living. So, you know, from that point of view, the best time that you're going to see a lot of connection and a lot of interaction is going to be after the workday ends. Um, any other thoughts there, guys? I want to keep us moving because I know we got to get into best part here soon. Okay, so plan of attack. For every six hours that you spend applying for a job, spend at least two hours virtually networking. That's, that's one piece. Also, revisit all of your social media profiles um, to evolve your presence. This should be an ongoing evolution. Get you in the habit of keeping it updated. Uh, think about your LinkedIn profile as a digital handshake. You know, use it as a tool for communication across mediums. Get used to saying, I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn, right? Start adding it to your email signature. Even if you have a personal email, add it to your signature. I think it's a great tool, especially if you are in the job search. Um, and then finally, keep an eye out for digital networking events on your community, uh, Rockstar Connect Meetup, virtual job fairs. There's some different groups out there. Um, so again, here's a meetup and what that looks like. They actually have some virtual stuff going on. They also do physical networking events. Um, and then our final part is just the art of the follow-up. So things to consider when virtually communicating, uh, you know, don't don't get discouraged, first off, if you aren't seeing a reply right away. People are busy, um, so hang in there. Make sure that you are rereading a communication before you send it. Context is a big myth sometimes when you're communicating digitally, so be careful there. 
make sure it's easily discernible, that it gets to the point and it, and it answers the question if there is one. Tread carefully when inquiring about a new connection on uh, a job opportunity it, with the new connection. So again, if you're just finding a decision maker and you're saying, hey, I'm really interested in a job, um, be careful about how you do that. There's some tech that needs to kind of be involved there and they might get blindsided, uh, especially if a recruiter's posted it and the hiring manager uh, might be in a different division. There could be some disconnect. So just tread carefully there. Uh, the three rules I have for you, one is uh, provide follow-up information ASAP. If you get a recruiter that's asking for something, get it to them. Second rule, always follow up to inquire on jobs and read the timing on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, so sometimes a week's appropriate. Others, you know that they're looking to make a selection by Wednesday. You know that you should probably follow up, uh, you know, a little bit more rapidly. And third, um, always send a thank you note post-conversation. Uh, you think these little things don't make a difference, but they really do, guys. Um, and I think uh, I get often really good feedback from managers that say, gosh, you know, that thank you note really meant a lot. So homework. Um, so before we get into best, uh, just again, these are the seven things that we want you to think about. Make sure your resume format is portable, readable for the ATF. Customize your wording and assure the keywords are aligned to the digital application. Evaluate and strengthen your overall social media presence, big deal. Uh, create and maximize your LinkedIn profile. Get your LinkedIn right. Get that digital handshake going. Um, take relevant pre-assessments when you have time. And take the steps to definitely start digitally networking now if you haven't done so already. And just remember to follow up. Very important there. All right. So, Beth, that was a whirlwind. <laughs> I know you're ready to go here, but, uh, but we'll answer some more questions at the end. Beth, uh, do you want to go ahead and dive into your section? Yeah, thank you, John. It was that was so good. It, um, I was an executive recruiter so years ago, so that like took me back to remembering that I found so many of our candidates when I was in HR through LinkedIn and just really, really great tips um, that you shared. So it's nice to be with you all. Um, as I just kind of job seekers always have a special place in my heart. Um, I think that's because up until about twelve years ago. I did everything wrong in my career I think one could possibly do. I was fired. I was terrible at another job, so I quit it before I got fired. Um, you name it, when I was kind of starting out my professional career, if, if, it, if I made a wrong step, if there was a wrong step to be had, I, I did it. Um, and I've also worked professionally as a, a college coach um, in another career for years. Um, so job, job searching is something that is near and dear to my heart, and I'm honored to be with you all today. I am uh, with the Workforce Center out of the Kentucky Chamber. Um, as Casey shared, the Kentucky Chamber is the state's largest business association. So we represent businesses and employers. Um, and our team, and many of which are on the call today, um, work with the business community to make sure that as we skill up and train Kentuckians, it's in the way the economy needs. Because what we believe is if you build a workforce that is ready for the economy of Kentucky, citizens make more earnings, they have better education, and they're much more employable in the ways that employers need them. That's just a little bit about us, but I'm going to talk about, I don't think I've, I've got the right to me in these slides, but I'm, I can move on. Maybe I do. Oh, I can. Yeah, here we go. Oh, John, you got it. That's right. Thank you. So we'll I just quickly talk about two points. One, I just want to talk about what we're seeing as far as economic signals during this COVID season. And we've got a job site um, that we wanna show you that has about 89,000 jobs on it. And we wanna encourage you to go on and, and use this job bank. So this um, economic report that we're seeing, and this is barring no further shutdowns, is that we're in the middle of a three quarter recession. So we're in the first quarter right now. So what we are hopefully seeing, again, nobody knows for sure, this is a place in time during COVID we've never been in, but all the, um, econ the economists out there show us that in a, um, in a more pessimistic view and in a more optimistic outlook, we're looking at three quarters of a bit of a recession, again, being in that first quarter. Um, unfortunately, as we've seen time and time again, not just in Kentucky, but all over our country, those being most impacted by job loss are our younger citizens, 
are our citizens that have lower levels of education attainment, so have earned under a bachelor's degree, women, and minorities have been disproportionately affected by job loss. And in Kentucky, we have the most unemployment claims from the COVID um, era. So we're number one in the country for uh, unemployment claims. We've got over 900,000 Kentuckians that have filed for unemployment as a result of this pandemic. Um, employers to keep employees safe had to shut down. Um, so and or they're trying to bury down the hatches to, to be in the bit of a recession we're in. So we look at the 900,000, we're number one in terms of unemployment claims and vulnerable jobs. So jobs that might be at risk for not coming back. And those populations we just discussed, the youth, uh, women, minorities are the ones that have just been disproportionately hit the most. It's something that our team, again, many are on the call, that is, is very serious about lifting up. We find in Kentuckians, Kentucky, when we leave populations behind, it hurts the economy time and time again. So not only is it the right thing to do to make sure everyone gets skilled up and ready for the jobs of the future, economically, it makes a lot of business sense. So John, you wanna keep rolling and I'll check the chat box. All right, so, and this is what we just reviewed. So, so nothing to, to really write home about here. Again, just being in the middle of the recession, we, we are hoping and optimistic that it will be short-lived, um, but time will only tell. We can say right now that the manufacturing, the automotive sector is doing incredibly well. This is technically, and you're in economics, the, the industry that you look at and you look to to see how the economy is performing. And right now they're over 100% capacity um, and, and performing incredibly well. And that's a, good, that's a good thing, especially in Kentucky when so much of our ec economy drives off of uh, the automotive makers. I just realized I used a the pun there. Okay, let's keep rolling, John. All right, so the thing that we talk about a lot is, yes, we've just seen a ton of unemployment claims. We cannot forget, and this is what we keep impersonating on the business community, is that four months ago, our economy was at a heightened state. We were booming as, as high as we ever have been. And 81% of Kentucky organizations from Kentucky SHRM had projected that they were ramping up for moderate to high growth. And during that time, 84% of those companies couldn't find the talent that they needed. And believe it or not, that was just four short months ago. In many ways, that seems like almost a lifetime ago, but it wasn't that far off. So when we think about not too long ago, we were in a heightened economy and we um, are looking at hopefully a short-lived recession. Uh, from a workforce perspective, as we work throughout the state, we are not going to take our foot off the gas pedals and make sure that we've got workers prepared and our Kentuckians ready to get to work in the jobs that we need them most in. John, we can keep going, please. Thank you. So, uh, one night, um, and I'm so glad Harper Smith and, and many of our team are on the call. Harper manages the Who's Hiring campaign out of the Kentucky Chambers Workforce Center. Um, as of the 17th, so late last week, we were up to 87,000 jobs. I saw Harper's report, I think, yesterday or the day before. We're actually up to 88 or 89,000 jobs. She's probably about to correct me and put the right number in the chat, but it's between 88,000 and 89,000 jobs. This campaign came about um, and was published in early April. And it happened because on day two of the shutdown, and I know many of you are sadly no stranger to, there she is, 88,000 jobs. Um, the, I know many of you are no not a stranger to potentially many of you may have um, experienced job loss of your own during this very unfortunate, challenging season. D day two of the COVID lockdown in Frankfurt, we heard reports of 14,000 Kentuckians losing their job in one day. Um, I physically fell over my sink um, sick because we knew it was about to get much, much worse. And the confusing part about that was, is at the same time it was getting hard and we knew jobs were going to get ready to get lost at a rate that have been unprecedented into today's time in our history. We also knew other industries were surging 
and needed employees in order to get Kentucky through the pandemic. And so that's why we launched this Who's Hiring campaign with the Education and Workforce Cabinet. So in the early days of the shutdown, the governor's team would look at the jobs we were posting every day and let us know that if these positions were at risk for being shut down, as we kind of slowly see the, saw the economy shutting down. So since April, we've, we've ran this job bank um, and have collected 89,000 jobs. The team that we have, that's many on the call, they work with employers to see, are these still active job links? Are they still um, needed? Have they been filled? And so these are active jobs that you're seeing on this website. And John, if we can just go one more. So um, Harper worked with our friends at Ulimi, who's a, a Kentucky company up in Northern Kentucky. They focus on artificial intelligence. As we grew this job bank, we were getting close to, I think about 70 pages of open jobs that, that were searchable. Um, and so Harper worked with uh, Yulini. They donated this robot. Her name is Heidi. You can see her pretty little unicorn face here. She's artificial intelligence. You can get on this website and just search the job bank. So you can search by industry. You can search by job type, full time. You can use Heidi to just kind of talk to you and she'll help you with your search results. Um, something to note about this campaign that we're really proud of is that this is also a fair chance hiring campaign. So if you are an individual who has returned from the incarceration citizen, uh, community and you've, you're back out and you're ready to work, we wanna welcome you into the economy. There are close to, an, uh, I think there's about 3,000 jobs that are available for fair chance hiring. Plug to our own workforce center team. We are a fair chance employer as well at the Kentucky Chamber. <laughs> <laughs> and Harper's in the chat box. She's always chasing me around with the right numbers, you all. So 3,000 fair chance jobs. Um, but we are a fair chance employer out of the Kentucky Chamber. And Lakeisha Miller, who is on this call, is our director. And she's got two positions that are currently open out of our shop. So search those, uh, whether you're a fair chance uh, returning citizen or not. Uh, there's a ton of jobs on there. So, John, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any, uh, but we'll get, I'm, I'm interested that Amy's on the call. Uh, she's got a ton of resources available to job seekers, and I know everybody is really eager to hear from her today as well. What is the website? Perfect. I will put that in the chat box for you. Okay. I hope everybody will visit the uh, who's hiring site? I'll push that site into the chat box uh, before I go. Um, and just know it's searchable by whatever part of the state you're in. Uh, there's jobs from Paducah to Pikeville, so please search it. And again, if you are looking for a second chance, there's hundreds of employers on there that are ready to, to hire you. So, I don't Perfect. See any Thank other you, questions. Beth. All right, and Harper put the website in there, so thank you. And Amy, thanks. Take it away. All right, well, thanks, Beth. Um, lots of good information, and I absolutely agree. Um, we have lots and lots of employers that are just begging for employees right now. So, um, so I'm glad to be here today to help job seekers and employers to learn about the services that we offer here in the Bluegrass um, to assist to this COVID um, that we're dealing with right now. Um, just to keep in mind as I go along, I'm focusing specifically on the bluegrass, but keep in mind we do have um, their career centers all throughout the state, 10 regions. Um, you can go to kcc.ky.gov and look up what location um, that you would need to go to. Um, each area is overseen by local workforce development board and they make the decisions as far as what services and that sort of thing are being provided in each of our um, areas. Um, John, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, in the Bluegrass, we cover these 17 areas, um, these 17 counties in this area. Um, they're listed there on the screen. Um, if you can see the green dots, that is where our four career centers are located. Um, Scott County is Georgetown is our comprehensive career center. Um, that's where we have vocational rehabilitation, the career development office, our workforce innovation and opportunity staff are all located in there together. Currently, due to COVID, our centers are not open. Um, we all very much hope that we'll be able to open them soon. Um, but I can assure you that all of our career coaches and our business service staff have not um, flinched once. They have continued to offer virtual career services 
through this entire um, past four months and, and we'll continue to do so as long as we need to. Um, through the um, Workforce Innovation Board and the Bluegrass, they have identified five high demand sectors and we really focus on those because that tends to be where the jobs are. Um, those are advanced manufacturing, construction, healthcare, IT and business, and transportation distribution and logistics. And there are lots and lots of, of those jobs available right now. Um, through, um, we also have a job list that we put out each week um, and we, we do share it with the, with the chamber with Sarah Tracy. And, um, you know, we, we definitely, if you, if you need employment um, or, you know, know someone that does, definitely refer them to us and we'd be happy to try to find a position that suits them. Um, regarding our job seeker services, lots of services that um, individuals don't know about. Um, the first one is our career planning and job search assistance. Uh, we can help individuals with everything from resume writing to interview skills. We'll do a mock interview with them. We'll help them job search. You know, if someone's been unemployed and um, they've worked for 20 years prior to that, they may not know how to do a job search or, or get online and, and know what Indeed is or know to go to the Kentucky Chamber. So we're there to help them um, with things like that. Um, we also offer through our um, career planning is occupational skills training. Um, this is where we will pay for someone if they need to go back to school to obtain additional skills. Um, our program will pay for up to two years in one of the high demand occupations. Um, up to $10,000 to, to get those skills to get back into a high demand job. Um, we also offer employability classes and workshops. Um, I've been very proud of our team here in the Bluegrass. Um, we have really jumped on board with the virtual learning. Um, each week we're offering workshops. Uh, we offer the business minute where we highlight an employer um, that has positions open, a resource minute where we um, let people know about the resource that's, resources that are available. And every Wednesday, we have a WIOA Wednesday. Um, we kind of have tried to go outside the box a little bit and, you know, the past six weeks we've been focusing on um, budgeting and preparing food on a dime um, because we know folks, um, if they're laid off, you know, they may need those kind of resources right now. Uh, we also offer work experience and internship opportunities and this is where um, an individual may be interested in an employer or an employer may have some positions open and they're not just sure who they want to hire. Well, we'll step in and we'll sign an agreement with the employer and we'll pay for up to 480 hours um, of their employment. Um, if they work full time, that's three months of employment. Most people have a 90 day probation period. If they go on our payroll, we pay for that 480 hours and that includes the workers compensation. Um, a lot of times employers or job seekers may think that there's a catch to that. There's no catch to that. If an employer is willing to participate in the program, we are happy to um, work with that job seeker and get them employment. Um, the hope with our work experience internship program is that they'll like them and they want to keep them. Um, if they don't, then they have absolutely developed some new skills and hopefully got a new um, reference to add to their, to their resume. Um, we have a youth program where we assist individuals ages 16 to 24 years old. We primarily focus on our um, 18 to 24, which is the out of school youth. Um, and with that program, we offer a lot of leadership development opportunities. And um, we also offer on the job training and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this further on in the presentation, um, but this is where we'll pay an employer, um, reimburse them up to 50% of the cost if they hire one of our job seekers. And then um, our last but not least um, support service I'm gonna mention today is our support service. And this is where if someone needs um, to take a test, um, if they need, um, new boots for a job or a uniform, but they're just starting a job, they've been out for a little bit and they don't have the funds for that, we'll pay up to $600 per year for up to two years to help them with those support services. Um, you know, our goal is just to make sure that folk, folks get back in, into work. Um, one program, if you wanna go to the next slide, is our Transitions to Transformation, our T2T program. So over the last year, we have really, um, just as the Kentucky Chamber has taken um, an interest in helping those folks that may have barriers to finding employment. Um, that's things like they may be in recovery, they may be um, have a criminal record, and you know someone that they have limited English um, language proficiency. Um, and so right now we have over 100 employers just in the Bluegrass area that has signed agreements with us that says that they are willing um, to work with us to um, hire those individuals. Uh, with these individuals, we do the work-based um, learning options, which is the work experience and the internships. 
Um, so far, it's been very successful. Um, we have lots of success stories on our website. If you'd ever like to check them out, we do videos of some of our individuals that have been through this program. Um, and we're, we're very happy with how, it, how it's going right now. So if you do know folks that, that need that assistance, please let us know and we'll reach out to them and try to help them get employment and, and go through our work experience internship program. Um, recently, we received the National Dislocated Worker Grant through the Department of Labor. And in the Bluegrass, we're calling this Project Defender. And through this program, um, it, it's specifically related to COVID. Um, we have decided that um, a way that we're going to help these employers and these job seekers is provide temporary employment. So for our senior citizen centers, for um, our nonprofits, and for some other employers, we're going to be providing temporary employment. Um, at our senior citizen centers, it's just whatever um, you know, positions they may have. They may need someone to, to deliver meals or they may need somebody to cook. Um, and so we'll pay up to a thousand hours, which is six months of employment at the rate that the, that the senior citizen center would normally pay someone. Um, we are offering the same um, service to the nonprofits and then for maybe some of our manufacturing facilities um, or just, um, you know, a, one of the schools or a daycare, um, we are training um, state registered nurse aides and then um, we are going to put them in a thousand hour internship to be like the temperature screeners, the people when you come in that are filling out the forms and taking the temperatures. Um, we felt that that would be very beneficial for some of these employers instead of having to ask, you know, a current employee to be the person that's taking the temperature. Um, and then the other um, thing that we're doing with the Project Defenders, we've hired a crisis counselor for our career centers in the Bluegrass. You know, when we went through the recession many years ago, um, we found that it would have been very beneficial to have a crisis uh, counselor there because folks are really dealing with a lot of things such as depression, anxiety, and that sort of thing from not having em employment. So um, we hope that this will help some of the folks as they come through um, our centers. Um, as far as our employer services, um, earlier you all had talked about assessments. We offer free assessments for employers. We have a program that we call Prove It. It's the IBM Connects the program and it has thousands of assessments available um, these are all free. Um, we, we work with many employers um, where we've gone through and given them the list of um, assessments that we have. And it could be something as simple as a, a typing test to um, an accounting test. And um, we, we give the test, we um, proctor it here um, in our career centers, and then we send the, the results directly to, to the employer. Um, we have found that um, this has been a very beneficial um, benefit to the employers, you know, as they um, hire their, their new staff. Um, we will do application administration. Um, we almost act as an HR function uh, with this. Um, we administer applications, we screen applicants. You know, if they say that a high school diploma is required, then we will screen and make sure that they have the high school diploma or GED and anything else that the employer may need. They may need just us to accept the applications and that's it and then we hand over but it helps them a little bit as they begin to hire new employees. We do offer customized training as well. Um, this is where um, a company may need to um, increase some training for, for a group of their employees. Maybe they're working on the line at a manufacturing facility and they need um, some additional skills to work in maintenance. And we can do a customized training. We'll, we'll pay for up to half um, with a max being $15,000 um, of the reimbursement to that employer. Um, we also offer this similar thing as the customized training. It's called incumbent worker training, and this is where we provide training to these uh, employers. We'll pay up to 50% with a max being $15,000. And with this, you know, a company may be, you know, getting ready to lay off um, some folks, but if they get this training, they can transfer them into a different position, and that prevents them from laying off their employees. Um, earlier, I had talked about the internship work experience. Um, but really, it's a, just as much of, of a benefit to the employer as it is to the job seeker. You know, the job seeker is getting the employment, but with the employer, it's basically free employment um, for 480 hours, and it gives them the opportunity to really screen that employee, uh, make sure they get the, um, the training that they need before they take them on and make them full-time full employees. And um, we will also provide the labor market information um, to the employers and to our job seekers. Um, we have multiple avenues that we use to provide this information. A lot of times, um, you know, employers may want to know what the skills gaps are um, in their area or with their company, and we will work with them on finding this information. We do have a laptop pool as well. Um, so if an employer is needing to do, you know, they do a huge hiring, they hire 20 people, and they want to assess them all at the same time, then we will provide them our, our 
Wi-Fi connection, um, as well as the laptops. Um, sometimes, you know, employers want classroom training and we'll bring in um, the laptops for them to do as well. And um, you can see there on the screen all the different uses we have for our laptop pool. Um, we do offer on-the-job training, which I mentioned earlier. Um, it can go anywhere from four to 24 weeks. Um, they would do an outline, a plan, and we will reimburse the employer up to 50% if the person completes, um, completes the OJT. Um, the benefit of this to the employee is that they get a job automatically. The benefit to the employers, they're getting reimbursed for up to 50% of the salary um, for up to 24 weeks. Um, we will post job openings. We will help employers post those um, on our website. Um, but we also will share any um, openings on any of our social media to make sure the word gets out if they have um, any anything that they have open at the time. Um, we have retention services as well. Um, for example, earlier I talked about the support services. If somebody is starting a new job, they've been off for a while, and they need assistance with transportation, say the first four weeks of employment, we can provide um, transportation costs. For example, maybe a gas card or um, a bus voucher to help them get back and forth to work during that first month for, for the first four weeks. Um, and then if they need um, to take a TB test or some kind of, you know, um, medical health test prior to taking the job, we can pay for those things as well. Um, we have tailored recruitment. Um, we've really um, tried to expand this um, since the beginning of, of COVID. Um, for example, last week we hosted in Daneville a curbside career center and we had, um, we set it up at the fairgrounds and we had employers set up their tents and individuals drove through and the employers would just hand them information and talk to them through the window. Um, so it was very successful. We had about 39 cars come through that day um, and we hope to set this up in other areas as well. Um, each week through social media, we are offering virtual job fairs um, and a lot of times it is the employer, but sometimes our staff will actually um, be the ones giving the information um, so we will do whatever we can to help um, employers recruit um, new employees for their company. Uh, you can find us online. Um, I've listed there the kcc.ky.gov, um, that's for the state. Um, the ckycareers.us, that's for bluegrass specifically, and that's where you can find our job postings just for the bluegrass. Um, you can follow the bluegrass's Facebook and Instagram pages, and we are constantly every hour updating new job openings, resources, that sort of thing. Um, throughout Kentucky, um, they did launch at the end of April, which was perfect timing, the Kentucky Career Edge. And this is just a really awesome, um, it's a web-based platform to provide career services um, throughout the state of Kentucky. They have 18 different modules that you can go through to learn about essential skills and that sort of thing. You can do your resume on there. And you even have um, a section on there where there's questions where you can record yourself the case manager can log in on the back end and uh, make recommendations and that sort of thing after you've done that recorded the, the interview online. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions anyone may have about our, our services that we're offering. Um, you know, we are just trying to help as many people as possible get through this and get back to work um, during this, this tough time. So thank you all for having me today. Thanks, Amy and, and Beth. I think I can speak for everyone on the call. I really appreciate how much you and your teams are dedicating all of your efforts to Kentuckians across the state. I think a lot of the programs and things that you guys are offering are really going to be helpful moving forward for them. So thank you. Um, so we've now reached the question and answer portion. Um, if anyone has any questions they weren't able to send over in the chat, you can go ahead and do that now um, with the feature at the bottom of the screen um, and we'll relay those to the panel members to see if we can get you some, some feedback on those. Um, Andrea, did we have any others that had came in um, during the presentation that we need to discuss? As of right now, no. I think they've all been answered that I've came through so far. I'll get ahead of one question. Um, we have a lot of links that were shared today, guys. Uh, again, we're going to record this. Um, it'll be available by tomorrow, and we'll make sure to get all the slides out there. But we'll, we'll also make sure to get all these links together. A lot of great information shared today. 
And uh, we even had an employer reach out to us today that, that, that also offered up that they were hiring for roles, which was great to see. And so we'll make sure to share that out uh, tomorrow. So keep an eye out on our website for that, absolutely. Well, we don't have any more questions um, for anyone on the call. We just want to thank you for joining us today. Um, I hope that you found the presentation to be very informative and helpful um, as you go out there and look for different things um, for careers and jobs um, and, and different tools that you might need to help prepare you for those. Um, if you'll mark your calendars for our next session, which will be next Wednesday, um, July 29th, with our guest speaker, Perry Schultz. Um, if you have any additional questions, um, we have our contact information for John and Ray on this next slide. Um, and if you have any questions that you think about after the presentation has concluded or anything that you didn't feel comfortable discussing on the chat, um, please feel free to reach out to John or Ray. Their contact information is provided there. Or you can find us on LinkedIn or um, reach us at hannahresource.com and we can get the answers to those questions to you that way. Otherwise, if that's all, um, we hope that you have a wonderful day and we hope to see you next week on our call. We should be sending out links for you to register um, so that you have that information to log in for next week. We appreciate you joining us.